Hi everybody and uh, welcome to our webinar today. We're delighted to have Stephen Malley from Fundraising Force with us today to walk us through some research uh, that Steve has done. So uh, without any further ado, thank you so much Steve and over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm Stephen Malley from Fundraising Force and I'm going to take you through exactly what mystery shopping is and some details on some key findings that I've discovered is um, I conducted a mystery shopping study over the last four and a half years in the NFP sector in Asia Pacific. And I'll take questions at the end, of course, so um, we'll allow plenty of time for those questions. So what I'm going to cover today is I'll define what mystery shopping is, talk to you about the background of this study, a little bit about why I did it. Uh, some people are curious why somebody would even undertake this. I'll talk about those key findings and then some next steps for the charities that are listening in in terms of how they can become engaged in the study or in mystery shopping as a product. All right, so what is mystery shopping? Um, some people call mystery shopping secret shopping. It's basically when a shopper is assigned to your company, in the case of you, your NFP, and uh, studies some defined areas for you. So they are focused on some specific scenarios and they're shopping them in secret. Uh, for, for you, they would be a donor, so they would be secretly shopping some scenarios as though they were an average donor. The shopper's role is to be quite hid, hidden and in the background from your uh, staff. So they'll interact with your staff in a very secretive way, but they will not identify themselves at no point in time during the shop should your staff be able to figure out that they're being shopped. They might suspect it, but it, at no point in time would that shopper ever identify him or herself. The shoppers really are mysterious to your staff. Your management may know that the mystery shopping is underway, but again, the staff will not know. The scenarios are established by the charity in a typical mystery shopping situation. And those scenarios might be problematic areas. They might be confirmation areas. So maybe you want to know as a charity that things are performing up to, up to the stated metrics, up to that service level agreement. And then typically the shopper will write a report for management and that report will be quite detailed. So against each and every scenario that you ask the shopper to shop, the, re the report will be issued in a narrative format. So they will identify the objective metrics that you ask them to measure. And also they'll put some subjectivity into the report. So how they felt about the shopping experience, um, what um, they experienced as an average donor, or customer of your nonprofit organization. So what are the benefits of mystery shopping? What's in it for you? I think first and foremost, um, mystery shopping helps any organization, whether for-profit or nonprofit, to improve their service levels. Um, mystery shopping helps you to literally identify where you've got some service lagging and where you can bring about business improvements. It helps you to solve known issues. So maybe you know that it takes too long for a donor to receive their receipt. Or maybe you know that your staff are not as engaging on the telephone as you would like. So mystery shopping will help you to solve those known issues because it will give you the data that you need to be able to work with your staff to improve those service levels. It will also help you to increase funds. Let's face it, you and I know that our biggest challenge is to 
get donors to give more often and to give at higher levels. And I think mystery shopping is one key ingredient that will help you to raise increased funds and increased numbers of gifts from, from donors. It'll help you to check on staff performance. I think there's nothing um, more motivating than for a staff person to know that mystery shopping occurs within our organization. They may not know that our organization is conducting mystery shopping right now, but at the end of the day, um, having been mystery shopped myself, I know that when uh, mystery shopping is conducted within an organization I work for, that I'm on my best behavior um, no matter um, who I'm, I'm dealing with. It'll help you to understand customer expectations. So a mystery shopping company such as myself will literally tell you what a donor expects and will tell you what a donor experiences. It'll help you to build your brand image and it will also help you to develop donor loyalty. So I think this list uh, offers key benefits to your organization and there probably are a host of benefits that you might uh, realize throughout the course of this presentation. So let me give you a little bit of background of the study. I mentioned that I started it in 2011. Um, it's now you know, well into its fourth year. And um, I started it, it's, it's a self-funded, self-guided, self-directed study. So it's got absolutely nothing to do with any company, including my own company. At the time that I started this study, I was employed elsewhere, and um, I was really motivated to see mystery shopping hit the not-for-profit sector in Asia Pacific. So that was my key driver for starting the study. I also um, started the study because I feel like every industry can use an outsider looking in. I travel each and every week, and I know that airlines, hotels, restaurants are mystery shopped. You and I know that TripAdvisor is available to us as uh, consumers of travel organizations. That's, that's um, a really key mystery shopping tool that's out there because you and I can evaluate hotels and restaurants, and we trust each other's judgments. We read about hotels and resorts before booking um, a certain hotel or resort. We read reviews about restaurants before we decide to, to make bookings in certain cities. And for me, I believe that not only can our for-profit counterparts improve their customer service, but you and I uh, working in charities can improve customer service day in and day out. There's always room for improvement. So that was another key driver for starting this mystery shopping study. In terms of the methodology, there have been several phases of the study to date. I started by giving to 100 charities and giving only $20. I gave that $20 through three key channels. One, uh, via the post. So I developed some letterhead for myself, personal letterhead, and I mailed a $20 gift to um, a certain uh, number of charities, about 33 of them. The second channel that I used was telephone, so I rang 33 organizations, and I offered to make a donation over the telephone. And then the balance of the organizations I gave online. So I literally searched for their website, tried to find the online giving forms on the website, and made a gift accordingly. So everybody got the same size gift uh, within a, a few days range in March of 2011. I made uh, those gifts over the telephone online and, as I say, mailed the, the gifts into the charities that were in the post portion of the study. I then measured and monitored the length of time it took to receive a, a receipt or a thank you letter and or thank you letter, uh, as well as all of the follow-on solicitations and stewardship communications 
that I received from those charities. It's important to note that these charities were divided amongst our sector as well. So there were education organizations, cultural organizations, uh, healthcare organizations, hospitals, medical research centers, uh, disease specific organizations, you name it. I think I really crossed the sector in terms of dividing up the types of organizations I gave to. Some people ask me, how did you pick the organizations you gave to? And I, my answer to that is I chose the organizations based on those that I was motivated to give to. So besides dividing up the sector and sort of um, having an equal number of types of organizations in the study, I really divided those sector subsectors up into the types of organizations or the exact organizations I was motivated to give to. And I think that's true of any donor, you know. Um, uh, donors typically don't divide up the sector the way that I did for this study, but they certainly do uh, give based on their motive or desire to give. Just a little bit of more background. I really, again, feel like our sector has an opportunity to improve customer service just the way uh, the hotel I checked out of this morning could improve their customer service and the restaurant I had dinner at last night. At the end of the day, we experience great examples of customer service, and I certainly applaud those in this study. We also experience areas where the timeliness of the communication was lagging or uh, the, the phone manner was um, a bit sour or things like that. When I um, grew up in America, I worked for the Golden Arches or McDonald's, and um, that's where I experienced my first mystery shopping. As an employee of McDonald's, most American kids uh, work at McDonald's, or I suppose these days Walmart or uh, one of the other big chains. And I remember in the interview being told that I would be mystery shop from time to time. And as a mystery shopper for McDonald's, they literally have to uh, monitor how you greet the customer, uh, whether or not the food you served them was fresh, i.e. made within the last 10 minutes, whether or not you uh, tried to upsell uh, a product. So if you've ever gone to McDonald's and been asked if you'd like the larger size portion, that's upselling in America. It's usually an apple pie suggested um, sale. Were the um, toilets clean? Uh, was the lobby clean? Um, did you get through the drive through in an orderly fashion? Did you get all the food that you ordered, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I believe that this study is a service to this sector, and, you know, because it's self-funded, self-guided, et cetera, it's something that I've chosen to do, nothing that I was certainly forced to do. I've written about it time and time and again. Today I'm only going to cover some highlights of the findings, but you can read more about it in Fundraising and Philanthropy Magazine. There is an article that I write each year, so there are four articles out there that contain various study findings in more detail than I can cover in the hour that we've got together today. In the end, it's really about bringing best practices to the sector. So what does the average donor expect when they call a charity to make a donation? What does the average donor expect in terms of the length of time it takes you to send a receipt or an acknowledgement? How do you treat that donor thereafter? Do you send handwritten notes? Do you send routine communication to let them know what you're doing with the funds received? Are you constantly asking them for money and not sharing your story? So let's talk about some of the specific findings. And some of these go back to 2011, but I've refreshed them over time. And if you want the latest and greatest stats, I'm happy to talk to you about that as well. As I looked at the audience for today's call, I realized that many of you had never heard about this study before today. Some of you might have not thought about mystery shopping at all. And so I wanted to take these findings back to the very beginning and offer some insight 
about the latest and greatest, greatest findings as well. So of the gifts that I made on the phone, that's the $20 gift that I made on the telephone initially, nearly 90% of the staff were engaging. They showed appreciation for the gift. Some even asked me what motivated me to give. Um, and, and I would say that, you know, they were really good experiences. I think about my mother as a donor. So my mother is 78 years old in a couple of weeks. And I think about, you know, the fixed income that they are on, and she's the average age of many of your donors, and how she would react to some of these situations. And at least for the phone call uh, that was made to the charities and the people on the other end of, of, of that phone call, they were really engaging and they would be warm and, and nice for my mother to talk with. About half of the people who accepted the phone call asked me for more detail than my name, address, and credit card. So they might have asked me for my mobile phone number or my email address. So half of them did. That's good. It's not terrific. Not every phone call was a success. So half of them requested that email address and mobile phone number, half of them didn't. And so I think that's really detrimental to those charities that didn't ask me for my email address or my telephone number because they have no way to contact me outside of my postal address. Um, and as you know, in this day and age, email and telephone are becoming more and more critical um, if you want to SMS any messages out, you have to have my mobile phone number. And of course, if you want to communicate by EDMs, you've got to have my email address. What a lost opportunity um, it is when that phone is disconnected. Besides e uh, the postal address, these charities have absolutely no way to contact me. Remember that millions of Australians move every year. Since 2011, I have lived in three different apartments, and remember that not every Australian opts in to uh, the mail redirection service where they allow charities to find out where they currently live. So lots of us fill out the mail redirection service form with Aussie Post, but not everybody opts in to having companies and charities receive the details. So at the end of the day, Charities that I gave to in 2011, unless they have kept up with me, are going to start to lose contact with me because um, not everybody renews those mail redirection services and, again, opts in. None appears to search the database for me. So what I mean by that is, in the background, I did not hear any keystrokes. Nobody put me on hold after receiving my name and perhaps my address details to look me up. And that was a lost opportunity, and I'll tell you why. Typically what you want to do is to uh, recognize continued support. So maybe Stephen Malley had given to these 100 charities uh, in the past, and that would have been an opportunity for the charity on the other end of that phone to recognize past support and to welcome Stephen Malley as a donor back. Additionally, it would have given them an opportunity if I was on the database, and remember, these are all new to me, but if I would have been on the database, it would have given them an opportunity to ask for additional contact details. So if you follow my blog or you've heard me speak publicly before, you've heard me say that whenever anybody rings, you meet with them or you um, – uh, have an email exchange with a constituent, it's your job to do what I call see a record, confirm, edit, and enhance. Confirm the contact details of the person on the other end of that phone or email or, or, or the visit, and say, Stephen, um, I, I see that you live at 23 Shelley Street, at which point in time I would say to you, I haven't lived there in a few years, and if I was on your database, you would then um, edit, that's the first E in confirm, edit, and enhance, edit those contact details. When you take that time to do that, you would do the second E, which is enhance. So you would note that you're missing my email, my phone. Maybe you'd ask me for my birthday so you can send me a birthday card and enhance the data in other ways, shapes, or forms. 
You and I are used to having this happen every time we make a medical appointment, every time we call the airline frequent flyer program, every time we call suppliers that we deal with personally, and they say, um, I need to have some details to confirm you are who you say you are. Yeah, some of that's for privacy reasons, but they're also doing what I call confirm, edit, and enhance. They're keeping their database up to date. The fact of the matter is, in these calls, I was a new donor, so I wouldn't have been on the database, but the charity employees never bothered to look to be able to even do confirm, edit, and enhance in the first place. One of the um, 33 that I called in the initial phase of the study, um, I, I mentioned that there are 100 charities in the initial phase. There are now uh, 370 charities in the study uh, in, in the phase that I'm in currently. But in that initial phase of the 33 that I rang, uh, one said to me, we can't take your gift over the phone. Uh, you've got to go online and uh, submit your gift online. First of all, I, w I almost fell off my chair. What charity couldn't take a gift over the telephone? Um, and, and why? Why couldn't you take a gift over the telephone? Let's go back to talking about my mother, my 78-year-old mother. She would have said, well, forget it then. Now, I didn't do that. Instead, I went online and made the gift to that charity, and I swapped one of the charities from the online portion of the study to the phone portion. But at the end of the day, that was a big strike against that charity. And I would recommend that um, each of you train your employees how to accept a gift through each and every channel, because not everybody uh, will log in and search for your online giving form. My surname is spelled M-A-L-L-Y, and I will tell you that um, some in this study had a very difficult time um, uh, understanding how to spell that surname. Um, I received many, many pieces you'll see coming up with misspelled um, uh, surnames, and um, I don't think that my surname is that difficult to spell, but um, some did. Take one cultural institution. I spelled my surname, I'll bet, eight to ten times for an employee on the phone. At least I thought she was an employee. Um, when the call was disconnected, my phone rang a bit later, and it was uh, a staff person from that charity saying that the person who I had spoken with uh, at this cultural institution was, quote, just a volunteer. And obviously, she couldn't get my surname right, so the staff person was going to make a go of it. The staff person then um, confirmed the spelling of my name, and you'll see in a little bit that even she didn't get it right. So not only did she discount the actions of her coworker who happened to be a volunteer, but she didn't get it right herself. One university, when I rang them, sent my call around campus uh, multiple times. I left multiple voicemails. It was really difficult to leave a gift for this charity. And my message there is train all of your staff to be able to accept a gift on the telephone or at least to know the right office, the right desk to send that phone call to. Um, uh, go back to my 78-year-old mother, she would not put up with being bounced multiple times around a charity. Let's move to online now. So not every online giving experience was a success either. So 10% um, of the charities in phase one couldn't accept a gift via the web. So in this day and age, it's 2015 now, I would expect that every single charity would have the facility online to be able to accept a contribution, and they would have perhaps multiple online giving forms. It was shocking to me that 10% of the charities couldn't accept a gift via their website. About 75% of the online part of the study didn't ask me for complete contact details on their online form, including mobile, and two did not ask me for their for my email address. So as shocking as that is, I'm giving a gift online, 
I'm filling out the online form, and they don't ask me for my email address. How are they going to get me a receipt? How are they going to communicate with me in the future? So here I am demonstrating that I'm an online person. I've got an online uh, ac- record of activity. I prefer to give online perhaps because I'm uh, trying to do that on the website, and they're not asking me for email contact details. Some schools and unis, I've got a whole phase of this study that's focused on universities and schools, and some of them sent me on what I call a hunting expedition to try to find their give now or donate now icons. Um, Schools tend to be very copy heavy on their website, uh, which is a big turnoff for somebody who's just trying to find something. And so um, test this out for yourself. Go look at some of the grammar school websites or some of the uni websites. They've got a great story to tell, lots of research, lots of programs, lots of faculties and schools and divisions and uh, rankings and all sorts of stuff to tell, which is terrific. They tell it in a lot of woods, and they make it very difficult for you to find how to make an online gift. Let's talk about stewardship as part of this. Um, and um, uh, this is actually where I sort of cover the post version of the study as well. So um, in the initial phase of the study, so that first 100 in the study, again, I'm up to three more than 300 now, 350, something of that sort. So in the first 100, three organizations phoned and thanked me for giving, giving via the post or online. So they added a bit of extra treatment. They might have sent me a paper or electronic thank you receipt, but they also added a phone call to the mix. And I thought that was quite impressive. Now, not, not everybody's a phone person, so they might have Uh, As a recipient of that, they might have been a bit short on the phone with the caller, but for me, I was really moved that somebody would take the time to thank me outside of the channel that I gave. I thought that was impressive. One in that initial 100 sent me a handwritten thank you note, and that was their sole uh, way of thanking me for making the gift. I thought that was kind of impressive. When was the last time you received hand, something handwritten in the mail? I guarantee you the next time that you do, it will stand out amongst the stack of mail that you get in a given day. Charities don't do enough um, in handwritten um, handwriting. Two sent me a handwritten thank you note months after I made the gift, and I thought that was an interesting approach. If you think about it, we pretty much expect things to happen within a week of us making a donation, usually within the first 72 hours. Here, um, two of the charities sent an additional thank you treatment months after I made that first gift. And um, that was in addition to the receipt and thank you. Um, One came from a client of this particular charity and the other came from a student. Uh, obviously of a school or university to tell me how much my gift meant to them. I thought that was pretty impressive. The length of time it took me to receive a receipt slash acknowledgement varied from the same day. Of course, you'd expect that with online giving to um, weeks to months. And in some cases, I never received a receipt or thank you. So I asked you, and there's no way for you to answer this um, via a webinar, but think about this. How long does it take your organization to send a receipt or acknowledgement letter out when the gift is received by phone or post? So let's take online out of the mix and simply focus on those other two channels. For some, it's the same week. For others, it might take a couple of weeks. For some, three weeks. For some, four or more weeks. Maybe some of you don't know. Maybe you have never, ever studied this. And if you fit into that category, it's time for you to get involved in mystery shopping. And maybe you're ashamed to admit how long it takes because 
you're not living up to um, the um, uh, metric that we really should do it in the same week. In fact, as I said earlier, it should be within 72 hours of that gift hitting your doorstep. So the gift arrives today, 72 hours from now, we should have that receipt back out the door. There are lots of ways to measure this in your database or CRM. And if you need help, just contact me. I'll put my details at the end. I'd be happy to offer you advice on how to track this in your database or CRM so that you can get a handle on how long it takes you. 10% of the receipts or thank you letters spelled my name incorrectly, um, and that's equally split amongst post, online, and phone portions of the study, and that is the shocking part. So not only did people on the telephone get my name spelled incorrectly, but when I gave it to them on letterhead, they spelled my name incorrectly, and even worse, when I keyed it into their online form, they returned a receipt with me and all subsequent communications with my name misspelled. Let me just give you a few examples here. So um, I, I put Arnold Schwarzenegger's picture up here because remember my name is spelled M-A-L-L-Y. It's not difficult the way Arnold's is. So here, if you look at this, this happens to be the online receipt that I received from a Melbourne charity uh, with my name spelled correctly. So clearly I keyed it in correctly. Uh, I know how to spell my name. I've been doing it for 51 years now, and I didn't make a typo. You know, we can all make typos, but I didn't. And look at the receipt that they returned back to me uh, a few days later. So my name is spelled incorrectly here. So clearly, this organization doesn't have their online giving functionality integrated with their CRM. Uh, which then generates the acknowledgement letter, clearly what this organization did was rekey my name and spelled it the way they thought it ought to be spelled. Here you can see the, um, the letterhead that I issued um, in the background, and then in the front you can see the receipt that was returned from this hospital, which happens to be a Sydney-based hospital, uh, I never identify the name of the organization. I will never, ever name and shame charities that are in this study, but I'm happy to tell you what vertical they come from. So those of you on the call that are from a cultural institution, you can uh, breathe a sigh of relief. This is from a hospital. What happened after that is I rang the hospital and I corrected the spelling of my name on the telephone, at least I thought I did, spoke to a really nice person at the hospital in their development office, and they apologized profusely. They thanked me for the gift, and they said that they would correct it in the database that afternoon. And then what happened was I got their Christmas appeal. And here you can see on the Christmas appeal that my name continues to be misspelled uh, despite having made that telephone call. So like all good mystery shoppers, I continued this journey with them and I decided to make a second gift and make sure that it was larger so that it stood out. And I, on the response form for the Christmas appeal, corrected the spelling of my name and uh, hoped that they would take it from there. And what did they do? They returned a receipt to me shortly after the Christmas break uh, you can see the 10th of January of that given year with my name misspelled. To this day, this hospital has not yet corrected the spelling of my name, coupled with the fact that I made a gift when a friend passed away uh, at that hospital. I made a gift in his memory uh, for the oncology uh, unit there. And I received now two sets of communications from this hospital, one Stephen Malley with an EY in the name and one as Stephen Malley with the correct spelling. So it gets even more aggravating from there. 
Let's talk about the phone. Remember earlier I talked about me uh, speaking to just a volunteer and a staffer at this organization. Here you can see that they got the spelling of my name incorrect. Uh, the left side there is a, um, uh, a solicitation that I've received on email, and on the right side there is an SMS that I get occasionally from them inviting me to exhibit openings, um, uh, book uh, discussions, and things like that. Let's talk about other issues, and then I'll um, open up for, for questions. Uh, salutations. So one of the key problems that I've seen with charities in this study, and this is uh, across the entire study, all 350 or more charities in the study, is that they oftentimes have difficulty in their CRM or database um, identifying proper salutations for people, or they might not use that functionality at all. So oftentimes I get called dear friend, um, dear Mally, dear Stephen M. Mally, dear Stephen Mally, dear F. Mally. It's unbelievable that um, uh, charities are not using dear Mr. Mally, so a title, or dear Stephen, dear Steve, Whatever it is, at the end of the day, salutation and addressee functionality exists in all reputable CRMs, and charities need to implement it so that they can properly address people. Uh, Dear Stephen M. Maui is not a proper salutation. Charities oftentimes have a difficult time making an ask in their solicitation. I wrote a blog post uh, that will go live tomorrow um, I think it's titled, um, you, you don't receive unless you ask. And um, I'm shocked at the number of charities that send me appeals, but they never ask me for a gift. I'm shocked by the number of charities in this study that send me appeals. They don't include a response device, but they do include a self-addressed envelope. So obviously I'm so supposed to do something with that envelope, but there's no device that, that's a call to action. There's no call to action. So if you uh, follow my blog, you'll see that post um, that will come out tomorrow. Another thing is a lack of regular giving um, solicitations. So in this day and age, um, a donor is not your donor unless they give three or more times. They're not committed to your organization. So right now I'm greatly lapsed to a number of charities in this study. But over the past four and a half years, I have been most surprised that charities don't ask me to become a regular giver. Uh, because after I give that third gift, I'm a committed donor. And so I'm surprised that um, even though charities might have a regular giving program, that they're not asking me um, to give a monthly gift to their organization. It's just a surprise to me. Certainly some have but the majority of charities in the study have not asked me to become a regular donor. Segmentation and packaging, this is another uh, baffling moment to me. So uh, a majority of the charities in the study, I'm not talking about the big marquee organizations, the big brands, but more mid-sized to smaller organizations send the same package out every single time they mail to me or email to me. There are easy ways to segment in most CRMs, not every CRM, but in many CRMs there are ways that you can segment your data, and certainly there are lots of great suppliers in the market who can help you to segment your database around recency of gift, frequency of gift, and the dollar value of, of, of that gift to help you make some targeted apps, to help you send uh, various different treatments out to them, it pains me when I see the same appeal going out time and time again, and it also pains me when I see uh, the same appeal going out to the entire database. I consult with a lot of charities week in and week out, and what I see is that they're sending out the same piece to the entire list. So they have to send out their tax appeal. The same exact piece goes out to all 100,000 constituents, uh, without uh, trying to segment the data and send different treatments to various segments. Telemarketers' phone manners. So I've had some very good telemarketing calls 
in follow-up to this study who have tried to get me to, you know, become a regular giver or perhaps to sponsor uh, an animal, a child, whatever it is, uh, maybe even to buy lottery tickets, et cetera. And you'll see on my blog, I have applauded charities time in and time out when I've gotten some very good telemarketing calls. I'll name the charity when they're not in the study. When they are in the study, I'll just talk about the type of organization that they are. So I certainly applaud good telemarketing calls. I welcome telemarketing calls. I'm a bit different from the average person. But I also have received some very painful telemarketing calls, um, calls where the caller calls me mate uh, more than 20 times during a call is a bit uncomfortable, calls when the ask is never really made, or calls when a script is read word for word rather than having a natural conversation with me. You can listen in on your telemarketer's phone calls. You can um, uh, mystery shop your own telemarketing firms. I suggest that you do. One of the last points here is that there's a lack of stewardship across um, the study. So of the 300 and some charities, 300 and some uh, hundred charities uh, in, in the study, uh, I'm, I'm surprised at the lack of communication between solicitations. Charities are, for the most part, good at soliciting me, uh, most maybe four times a year on average, some as many as 38 times a year. So I don't lack for an ask. Some of them are just targeted, as I pointed out, as I'd like. But I do lack in terms of stewardship that I've received. All right, let's talk about next steps. So I hope that I've offered you some nuggets of information from today's webinar that you can apply, some metrics that you can put in place, some things that you can look for within your organization. Um, you're certainly welcome to become part of my mystery shopping study. So just ask. There's no cost to be involved in the mystery shopping study. I'll put up my contact details in a moment. And you can email me and ask me to be part of a future phase of the study. I will not share the results with you as part of the study, except to share them globally in nature, um, as, as I do in presentations, um, webinars, uh, articles, and things of that nature. But you can certainly ask to be part of the study. You can certainly hire a mystery shopping professional. and. There are um, some mystery shopping professionals out there in Australia. I happen to be one of them, and I happen to offer a product called N NP Mystery Shop. You can certainly um, hire us, and we will do a very focused study uh, for your organization. Um, the mystery shop that I run happens to be very customized and tailored to each and every not-for-profit. A share of the cost of the product is given back to the charity in terms of the donations that are required as part of your scenarios. So if you ask me to buy a $100 lottery ticket, $100 of the cost of the product goes back to your charity as an example. You also get a full report that's very detailed um, to your um, charity on each and every scenario along with some uh, suggestions on process improvements, um, uh, customer service improvements that you can make. And for more details on that particular product, you can certainly contact me on email, and there are my contact details. So Derek, I'm going to pause. I know we're at about 10 to the top of the hour. I'd like to take any questions that might have come in from the participants. Sure. Thanks so much, Steve. We um, have prompted our attendees to provide some questions through the chat window, which is just the left-hand side of their screen. But so far, I'm not seeing any questions. So I think everybody just must be sold and convinced on the, the fact that maybe they need to do some mystery shopping. <laughs> um, one of the things that we can do, Derek, in, in follow-up is um, share the articles from Fundraising and Philanthropy Magazine, maybe a couple of them. Um, we, sure. we can also share, I think you're planning to, a copy of this deck um, in, in follow-up. And I'm happy to talk to people one-on-one -on -one if they've got questions about mystery shopping as an industry, um, ways that they can either self-mystery shop or um, how they can engage us or, or others in, in the effort. 
Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, everybody that attended today will receive some links in the next few days giving you access to Steve's presentation uh, along with a few other bits and pieces as well that we think you will hopefully find valuable. So uh, unless there are any questions popping in guys, we may finish a little early. Good. Well, thank you. I hope everyone has a great day and thanks for inviting me. Thanks very much, Steve. We appreciate your time. Thanks, everybody.